Every tree is also particular to its place where it grows. So that's the kind of building we're trying to create, a building that is more similar to a living organism. How are you today? <laughs> Great. Actually, we were just at a, a pool party, so all is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds great. Wonderful, wonderful. So nice uh, to be here with you, Scott. The Valerie was asking what an earthen hand was today. <laughs> earthen hand. What, <laughs> what a good name. <laughs> what is an earthen hand? Well, I, you know, I named my company after the earth itself. And my inspiration for that was to really to be the hand of the earth, you know, because we are, we are the earth. I was just saying this a moment ago. And so we are the hands of the earth. We can express uh, what the earth wants to create through us. <laughs> she also said, oh, does that mean the earth is in hand as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's often confused with earth in hand. Yes. And it's the same and earth in hand meaning, meaning that, you know, we're always working with the Adobe material and we always have a little bit of clay and sand on our hand. <laughs> and if your hands were made of earth, it would be high dielectric. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You got to get some of that high dielectric uh, crystalline <laughs> sands, just rub it right. all over yourself. And uh, we were talking about you today. We had such a great time when you're here and, and your lady was very impressive. She's very disciplined and organized. And <laughs> oh, she's wonderful. Yeah. Actually, we uh, prepared our uh, rice pasta in the way we learned from her for months afterwards. <laughs> so, yeah, so today's conversation, um, I, I thought we'd give it a shot at trying to be quite organized, at least initially in a preliminary outline kind of way about what actually biologic architecture means in very specific, even electrical terms. That was the idea. And um, I think where that story sort of starts is, um, <clears throat> as we've often said, you know, you already inhabit an array that is your synapses, which is a net of fireflies, I mean, a nest of spark gaps. And what it is that inhabits the nest of spark gaps is very essentially something which is measurably centripetal. So if ever there were an elect was an electrical definition of consciousness, among other things, it would be the, the ability to be electrically centripetal. Uh, Bill Tiller's famous measurements that focused attention causes charge to compress. So whatever inhabits, uh, by definition, has to be electrically centripetal or the array is not going to be glued together. <laughs> and as we uh, often talk about the kids who see without their eyes when they're blindfolded, the first thing they see blindfolded after they go into this bliss state where the harmonics of the brain waves enable their brain harmonics to also get centripetal and do a squeezing. And so the kids always say, well, then a little tube vortex tornado, a little tube, literally a vortex shows up inside their head and they play around with the angle and the focus until they squeeze that tube, and as the tube is squeezed, and the inner muscles to do that is the magic, it's literally a bliss state. You, they imagine themselves in beautiful nature. Their brain waves flip a switch, and they get fractal and start imploding. And, uh, and then that state of a quasi-trance state and enables them to squeeze that vortex inside their head, vortex looking like this, and then... The center of that charged plasma vortex uh, becomes an eyeball. And that is the point that that vortex uh, did not become aware or conscious until there was the possibility of imploding or getting centripetal. And the term inhabit here from the Hebrew inhabit, in the H as in Yod He Vah He, Hebrew for five means uh, amorphous and space filling the breath. So inhabit literally means charge is breathed into the space. 
and the breath specifically has to be centripetal. So literally, from an electrical engineering viewpoint, what makes your skull inhabitable <laughs> is that a charged vortex is enabled permissively to get centripetal there. Now, if you happen to have had French fries for lunch, uh, it'll mess up the dielectric constant of that cavity, and therefore your brain will get foggy and you won't focus as well, <laughs> especially if it's made of the wrong oil. So the, the capacitance of that cavity determines whether you're able to implode it and determines the sharpness of your focus. And uh, as in, we'd have this Therify.net famous plasma system, and 30% of the people come out saying, my vision sharpened somewhat uh, because they got more centripetal. And by the way, usually if you, after you take a pee, <laughs> you see a little sharper too. And the reason is the urine flushed out, restoring your dielectric constant. <laughs> so there's many things that sharpen your vision and also going into biologic architecture. Will, if it's done right, literally electrically cause your vision to get sharper because the little vortex that you call perception inside your head <laughs> got squeezed, and so the sharpness of the point. So it is that ability in a space to implode charge that is the definition of all life force. So that's that's where we start with defining biologic architecture. How do you make a capacitor, a charge envelope, within which that implosion is enabled? Obviously, the geometry of the harmonics determines if it can implode. And the electrical quality of the material determines it, if it can implode. We call that quality of material, we call it dielectric constant. Um, you know, most of you are familiar with our original chart and curriculum for biologic architecture. I'm gonna try sharing a little screen here one moment. This is from the original, so this is Michael Rice. Here is an egg shape and the wood has a high dielectric constant. And when we sat in there, Everyone just would smile. <laughs> Everyone was just happy because it was so so blissful to be there. And this egg shape was reflected in the building that contained the egg. And Michael Rice often uses the egg shape. These are very old slides, but you get the idea that the reason you use geometry is to make the charge implode. In other words, bragging that you use the right ratios is not the final determinant of whether you succeeded. What actually measurably determines if you succeeded would be if you created a, a space in the room where implosion was enabled. This is actually the definition of temple, of sacred space. Uh, for example, you all know that in the Sufi film, Meetings with Remarkable Men, the greatest saint was the one who knew how to make an echo. So they were literally between the mountains and they had this contest, who can make the echo? This is Gurdjieff's meetings with remarkable men. Well, it turns out that making an echo here is more than metaphor for the skill to be a biologic architect because the place where the sound wave longitudinal bounces recursively to center is more than metaphor for where the capacitive voltage charge wave also converges and implodes to center. So that is specifically what Carlos Castaneda meant when he said, you know, every time you go into any room, you feel your way around and find your place of power. <laughs> what did he mean? The place of power is the place where the charge waves implode, which is often parallel to where the phonon sound waves implode. And that's the sweet spot, the implosion spot, the heart of the matter, et cetera, et cetera. So if you were if you got the ratios right, then that implosion would actually create a set of capacitive harmonics, which would be measurable. And there's all kinds of ancient metaphors for this. And, uh, you know, that they, uh, there was an argument about whether these ancient forts were really designed to create sacred space. And they said, well, no, this was mostly a military consideration, but actually the military considerations have a lot to do with the design of capacitors, <laughs> of why they were pent. But the, one of the main points we wanted to make here was um, the very concept of stupa or sacred space uh, is inherently, directly, 
connected to the idea of what makes a capacitor implode, which is to say, recursively cause the voltage charge wave to converge towards center recursively implosively. So for example, the ancient stupas, they didn't have the problem. Now they put these things under electric power transformers and they're disgusting. And now they put metal rebar in the con concrete and they're disgusting because they forgot what sacred is. Oops. And the only one that can really tell them what sacred is, is someone who understands that electrically. <laughs> and uh, is the gold here is a wonderful service to that. So, the, But the main reason I broke out the slideshow is this very old slide, which I hope you've all seen. But so here is where we talk about what does dielectric constant mean? Uh, dielectric constant refers to the material between the plates of a capacitor, there's two metal plates, and you got sandwiched in the between there, a quote unquote insulator whose dielectric constant determines the efficiency of that capacitor, which simply means the voltage between the two plates starts those two plates ring like a bell. And if the material sandwiched between the two plates of a capacitor has a high dielectric, that means that the bell is ringing efficiently. In fact, <clears throat> you could even meditate on this. This is a, a, a quasi-spiritual idea from an electrical engineer that there are certain dielectric materials, uh, barium, strontium, titanate, phase conjugate mirrors, which if the dielectric constant of that material between the plates of the capacitor is high enough, then that capacitor is by definition a zero point energy vacuum energy source device. In other words, you have access zero point energy by definition if the dielectric constant of the material you stuck in there is high enough <laughs> because it's literally implosive. That means charge distribution efficiency. So to think rigorously about this, charge distribution efficiency defines life and defines architecture success for the reason that if that term is used in by electrical engineers, because charge definition of distribution efficiency is another name for God. Hello. <laughs> in other words, uh, sacred space, ancestral memory, et cetera, et cetera. So back to this chart. So what we say is that Steiner essentially was right when he said the children should never touch synthetics, polyester, plastic, and aluminum. The children should, or steel or aluminum, the, the children should only touch in the D D Steiner school material that was once alive, uh, wood, natural fabric, and of course, uh, limestone and calc. These are all biologic materials which have inherently a higher dielectric constant. And what that means is that the molecules in material that were once part of life danced around and they saw my bumper sticker, which says get fractal or get dead. And so the molecules rearranged themselves into a fractal and that was called living material, which means charge distribution efficiency, which means when your child sits in that building made of living building material, their aura can breathe. This is the... This is the storal to the mori here. This is the bottom point. So I'm going to turn off the slides in a minute, but just so you get the idea that among fabrics, high dielectric versus low, among stone, among wood, for example, close-grained hardwood are a higher dielectric than coarse-grained softwood. And it makes sense because obviously the capacitance is better distributed in certain hardwoods. It has to do with trace mineral. There's many factors, but the general concept is very simple. Now I'm going to Turn off this picture here. Stop this here. So here's the goal. Your kid wanders into a building. Can their aura breathe or not? Which is to say, when they go to bed at night, is there a place for their lucid dream to go? Uh, remember, we've, we, we did a quite a bit of work on this. We studied the physics of lucid dreaming and the physics of soul. And it has directly to do with biological architecture because, so we won't dig up the slides here, but they're at um, therify.net and flameandmind.com. But the slides show that in the university studies on which frequencies cause lucid dreaming, 
it's 29 and 40, 49 hertz, I think, uh, that those frequencies that in the university study actually helped trigger lucid dreams, we later realized these are the frequencies that are phase conjugate to Planck, which is golden ratio multiple of Planck, which is to say are implosive. So when you get compression working, Terrify.net plasma, triggered by exactly that caduceus of low frequencies, is famous for triggering lucid dreaming. And remember, those who lucid dream measurably are going to be the ones who take something with them at death. Is that important? Yes. <laughs> and so, so the ability to experience compression, that squeezing process, for example, where magnetic lines cross, the perfect place to put a temple, that squeezing process squeezed out the center of that vortex and the transverse wave at the squeezing point where pine cones kiss, the transverse wave are sorted into the longitudinal waves, sometimes called scalar, which is what gravity is made of, which is what the collective unconscious is made of. And that coherent longitudinal interferometry is sometimes called the Kesjan body, rainbow light body, um, and or the Ba from the Ka. These are terms that were used in the spiritual literature that electrical engineers today need to understand in order to understand what a soul is. So when you make that body of coherence around your aura, you assemble something. Gurdjieff called it, you know, have you made your Kesjan body? You ain't going to get immortal unless. Well, if you're living in a steel and aluminum building full of electrosmog and crap, <laughs> it ain't gonna, that ain't gonna grow too good. <laughs> So the physics of soul is literally to accrete that coherence around your aura. Okay, so I'm carrying on and talking very fast here, which I enjoyed. <laughs> but but I'm happy to do some questions in between, shall we? Or well, thank you, Dan. You know, it's just such a pleasure having you here. And um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of questions, and I think I'd like to start with a couple of my own, and then open it up for students here, but. You know, mostly what I'm interested in right now is I talked with Lydia and Arturo about the differences between designing a temple versus designing a home. And essentially what I'm gathering is that, you know, there may be certain forms and um, certain forces in the earth, say of different locations, different magnetic lines that are wonderful, wonderful for a temple but they're terrible for your home. So how can we um, decide, you know, which types of geometry are appropriate for a home and which ones aren't? That, that's a lovely and a very useful question. Actually, I remember as we were playing around with the sacred mountain uh, in uh, Byron Bay, um, Mount Wollumbin, Mount Warning in Australia. And the natives were so absolutely clear that the spa sacred space is never the living space. If you ask any tribal person about that, the sacred space and the living space, uh, are they? No, <laughs> the sacred space and the living space are never the same space. Why? <laughs> well, another thing we learned about sacred space was if you... You know, so friends of ours in Western New York, they studied all the ancient tumulus, the stone stone monuments of the area, and they came to the conclusion that none of these sacred stone circle structures ever was used to live in. Nope. <laughs> they used them to charge the seeds. So the seeds would germinate. That was a function. They also used them for birth and death. <laughs> you know, whenever you need the stargate and the portal to work. Oh, yeah. But did you use them to live in? Never. So essentially uh there's i think there, we could even take a clue to this from what uh is another known aphorism of biologic architecture is that uh where the water veins cross is a great place to charge your seeds and to send prayers but it's a horrible place to sleep <laughs> Do you, do you know why you you should design your house so carefully in fact our biologic architecture here they actually do it if there's a water vein under the house they design the house so the water vein is under a wall so nobody is going to sit there <laughs> why do they do that well it's actually ultra simple it's because 
if you try laying down and sleeping over a water vein, where is your aura going to go? It's going to want to go with the water for the same reason that if you drive kids by a rushing river, suddenly every one of them needs to pee. <laughs> it's the same physics. <laughs> It, it, it's it's that the water wants to return to the flow. <laughs> it's very simple. So if you got a really living you know river you, that, that any water nearby is going to want to jump in for you, <laughs> whether you wanted to pee or not, you're going to need to pee. <laughs> um, so uh, the the idea here is that sacred space is a space where the charge compression is such that you can do certain important tasks like trigger seed germination. You can use it to launch lucid dreaming beautifully. And probably it will be a horrible place to sleep. In fact, probably you can't sleep there, or at least uh, it's like sleeping by a rushing river. So this, this is one idea underlining the sense of the difference between a biologic house and a biologic temple. The temple has a rate of implosion which would be very good, for example, for healing, for birth and death, for stargates and portals, for launching a lucid dream, remote viewing, all kinds of cool, fun stuff. Uh, but uh, in terms of a place for sleeping or living, remember, even uh, quote unquote sacred plasma systems like therify.net, there is such a thing as too much. And if you get too much, one of the symptoms is actually dehydration which would be one symptom actually of trying to live in a temple <laughs> because your, your body is imploding all that time. So um, another thought about this, it, it, I remember, I guess the story I've told too many times, but I was there with Gus Chikachi in his temple home in uh, Massachusetts in New England. We had just gotten back. Well, he introduced me to Bucky Fuller, actually, and he built his house like one rung on the ladder of DNA, hex, pent, and a golden ratio rectangle, and a hex and a pent. So the top-down view of his house is one codon of DNA. That's the top-down view of his house. Now, in the hex part of the house, you were allowed to have secrets. In the pent part of the house, you were only allowed to have distribution and secrets were not possible. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's actually good physics. You see what I'm saying? So there's certain parts of the temple, you know, square root of two geometrics cubic incubating was possible there. And in the other parts where pent was possible there, you could repent and be saved. I mean, you could make your memories shareable. And literally, repenting is literally allowing the embeddability that restores to distribution. So, yes, you can have a, quite a conversation about, you know, the difference between a house, a home, and a sacred temple. But the short answer is, you know, in the home, you design certain areas whose capacitance is designed for distribution and openness and others for privacy and secrets. And that is based on geometry and it is related to hex versus pent beautifully. But in general, the, the level of implosion that creates what we call sacred space or temple, where, for example, repeatedly it has been proven telepathy is enabled. Magnetic line cross points of the earth, telepathy is enabled, which is a great place to do telepathy, but probably a horrible place to sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> Michael Rice told me a story about uh, some folks that tried to design and live in a septagon-shaped house, seven-sided house, and apparently it did not go well. <laughs> well, you know, seven-sided is a shadow of a tetra cube, <laughs> so it would be not unlike living in a cube, theoretically, which would, would not be good, probably, okay. actually incubating because you, the square root of two harmonics create max destructive inter interference, which is perfect for isolating charge and terrible for distributing charge. So whenever nature wants to isolate charge, she uses square root of two incubation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk a lot about designing our buildings so that we're not isolating ourselves from you know, the Schumann resonance and the other vibrations that are surrounding us in the, from the cosmos, right? So if you surrounded yourself with a cube a age, perhaps like a, a network of steel studs or 
uh, even steel or aluminum roofing materials, these are all pretty terrible for our bioenergy field, correct? That's right. They, it's very hard to lucid dream through an aluminum roof. And <clears throat> the idea is that I did this new film Elena Danan is releasing today on the deep science of love. And the short answer was love is perfect embedding, <laughs> literally, which is the opposite of charge isolation. <clears throat> which means, you know, you don't build a Faraday cage if you want to feel the Schumann harmonics. You build the opposite. You build the sacred tree. <clears throat> Bless you. Well, yeah, so it's been, I don't know, about a year now. I have I got your Flame in Mind software and I got the Muse 2 carbon fiber headband uh, antenna and I've been measuring capacitance in different spaces both indoors and outdoors, and just sort of taking notes. And um, honestly, I'm still just a beginner at reading the measurements that I've taken. But I gathered from your book, Planck Fire, and, uh, and your websites about the Flame in Mind uh, software, that it seems that the 53 hertz or 50 hertz in that, in that realm shows up repeatedly in every sacred space. So um, can you walk us through some of the numbers of the vibrations? Because like the Schumann resonance is about 7.8, 8 hertz. And then if you if you work with those, uh, you talk about Planck, the musical key signature of the universe times integer exponents of the golden ratio, phi, right? So this is a series of numbers this shows up in everywhere in the universe, all the patterns, all the geometry. And so sacred space has these certain vibrations in it that we can we can start to read in the from the measurements, right? So we're looking for 7.8, we're looking for 53. Are, are there what are the other numbers in the series? Yes, <clears throat> very useful conversation. Actually, I think for that conversation, it would be good to uh, look at the visuals on that. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's do that. And for that, um, the main website about that is um, flameandmind.com slash life force. And so if I went to flameandmind.com slash life force and then showed you some of those measures, as we bring that up, I'd like to remind people that <clears throat> here are some of those measurements you're seeing my screen. Yes. <clears throat> so this, first of all, <clears throat> like in the measurement of this tree here, this is a super, super happy sacred tree. And we put the, the brainwave measure on the tree and we spectrum analyze. And sure enough, here we have the 7.8 hertz. And here we have the 14 and the 30, I'm 33. You know, we, we got a map of the Schumann harmonics. It was gorgeous. This was a super happy tree. But you're not going to get this out of every tree. This was a tree that was not near a noisy road. This was a tree when it's not windy. Um, and uh, this is a tree that was super healthy and happy. Actually, it would happen to be in the center of a stone circle. So well, the way we label this in the spectrum analyzer, flameinmind.com slash life force, you see that <clears throat> the known Schumann harmonics here are in blue and the measured harmonics here are in yellow. And... Um, I'm going to pick a different slide that shows 5053 a little better. But first, let me sh explain the theory a little more. So <clears throat> the known Schumann harmonics here are in green. And this is a little small. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Yeah, it's a little bigger. So here is 7.83, 14.3, uh, 20.8. And the next one here would be about 30. So in green, you have the, the actual theoretical Schumann harmonics, which are displayed down here. Well, I'll get that chart out in a minute. So in green, the, the known Schumann harmonics in blue, you see would be actually exact golden ratio times Planck. And so that is the theory of PlancFire.com that if you take the actual, they start with Planck eggs and do simple exponents, actual accurate integer exponents, golden ratio, get 2.78, 7.29. And 11.8 and 19.09. And this becomes very significant because later when we see that the theoretical Schumann 
should have been 50 hertz, but the measured Schumann was 53 all over the world. <laughs> and that is exactly the ratio between 7.29 theoretical perfect and 7.83, the actual Schumann harmonic. So the earth natural resonance was set up probably by Hermes, the, where the Schumann harmonics is almost a perfect phase conjugate pump wave implosive, which is why Gaia is negentropic and self-aware, and why the brainwave harmonics right here are actually in that cascade. Let me see if I reload this. I get more of the pictures. So, uh, so I wanted to show you some of the measurements we made that um, Scott nicely referred to here. Notice that the Earth is pulsing every 26 seconds, which is actually the Mayer wave, 0.1 hertz. So the most important frequency of the blood and the shoot and the uh, sacrocranial, the most important HRV frequency in the world, 0.1 hertz, a 10 second wave, happens to be a natural resonance of the Earth. Hello. So this, yeah, this is what uh, Scott was referring to right here. So here, this is. Uh, bamboo architecture this is actually in bali and here's cows in a field and here's a biologic dome and here's the visico pyramid in bosnia and what do they all have in common here's that 53 hertz peak okay and here is the schumann cast the schumann harmonic down here there's a little peak there uh yeah and you see if you actually look at the documented agreed in physics schumann harmonic 7.83 14 so that ratio between 7.29 and 7.83 actually produces the difference between 50 and 53 hertz. It's interesting because you know, when, when you measure in the top of the Bosnian pyramid, the, the 20,000 hertz, it actually fits that cascade perfectly as well. It's actually 20, 28 kilohertz. That's the actual, the, the theoretical, if you can't carry the cascade from theory on, it becomes 26,000 hertz. The measured in Bosnia and elsewhere is 20, almost 28,000 hertz. And it's because of that difference between what the actual Schumann cascade is and what the Earth grid. But, um, and th this is the original chart of golden ratio harmonics and Planck. You've probably all seen that from PlankFire.com, predicts hydrogen geometry. And this is a dominant geometry of all orbital mechanics in general is golden ratio times Planck. The reason that golden ratio times Planck dominates all orbital mechanics in general is because that's the only way you can make stable gravity and therefore atmosphere. So, but back to uh, Scott's very useful question. This is very hard to measure in most houses. If it's windy, it ain't going to happen. If it, most times when you actually can measure a house doing something magic like this, generally it probably is necessary to go downstairs and turn off the main circuit breaker because <laughs> the electrosmog will overwhelm these harmonics. And when we were measuring using the same tools to measure fresh fruit you could measure whether food is fresh or you can measure whether an egg is alive or dead this way there's pictures site but you could only do it in super quiet environments so in most buildings uh the schumann resonance is so far from available that uh, uh but if you if you're in a very quiet nature space and there's not much wind and things are really quiet there's no no electrosmog you get lucky then you can measure the Schumann cascade and by the way if you can measure it that will generally predict in advance what tree is going to live what house is going to be sacred so it's a very useful skill to work on this anyway go ahead Scott brilliant thank you for that Dan well, I'm curious uh, what questions you guys might have. Is, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask at this time? Is everyone imploding? I mean, blissful. Okay. Yeah. If you don't have any yet, it's okay. I. So you talk a lot about non-destructive charge collapse. Exactly. That is the point. I think it's it's hard for the beginner to grasp how uh, pervasive um, this phenomena is, you know, and just how uh, it's it's so crucial to understand, you know, why gravity works, um, how life works, why we're alive, um, exactly how consciousness works. Um, so it, it's amazing and and so incredibly exciting to find you know, one equation that explains all these seemingly disparate things 
in the universe. And um, I don't know, maybe you want to talk for just a couple of minutes about your process uh, in arriving at that discovery. Well, thank you for <laughs> thank you for asking the the perfect public relations question. <laughs> no, but, you, but you're you're right. You see, <clears throat> the when charge starts to implode towards center. Remember, the universe is made of a single contiguous compressible medium, which is a superfluid, sometimes called the ether. And the stuff of that superfluid is named charge. And plus and minus charge is the compression rarefaction of that superfluid. And that is the ether. That is the stuff of which the unified field is made. And there is nothing else. And anybody that tries to say, oh, you know, gravity is separate than electromagnetism or consciousness is separate from electrofields, electrofields, anybody tries to convince you of any of those separatenesses, just tell them they're schizophrenic and you don't want that disease. <laughs> no, it's a unified field and that's the only thing that works. So once you understand that everything is made of that compressible superfluid called charge, <clears throat> then you can begin to think about why Conventional physicists virtually have all agreed that charge collapse causes gravity. That's not new information. What causes, what causes charge collapse is a new information. That's the question I answered with Planck times golden ratio. And also, in addition, a very large number of psychologists and neuroscientists also agree that charge collapse causes consciousness. And they're right. And the new information is what is the cause of charge collapse. And that's called Planckfire.com, P-L-A-N-C-K-P-H-I-R-E.com, which you take Planck, the musical key signature of every wave in physics, and you simply multiply by golden ratio harmonics, exactly, which is called fractality perfected. And by the way, almost all physicists already agree that fractality is cause, cause of gravity because they already know that Fractality is the definition of infinite non-destructive compression, which is Einstein's name for the solution of the unified field, infinite non-destructive compression. So it's not even new information that fractality causes gravity, and it's not new information that charge collapse causes gravity. The only new information here is what's the cause of fractal charge collapse, and that is start with Planck, multiply by golden ratio, and you get all this beautiful every living biologic frequency well, Earth, your Venus, your galactic, your processional, you're the dominant geometry of all orbital mechanics, the dominant geometry of all biologic mechanics, the dominant frequency of everything negentropic in the universe. So how does that work? So when the charge is inhabiting, for example, a hydrogen atom, I wrote the equation to prove this is specifically the hydrogen atom and the reason that hydrogen has and makes gravity, multiples golden ratio, so this enables charge collapse. What it means is that the waves can add and multiply recursively constructively because of golden ratio moving towards center. And that implosion of charge towards center starts an inertia, a wind of charge moving towards center. And the inertia of that wind of charge moving towards center, that geometry of compression initiates acceleration of charge towards center. The only definition of gravity is that acceleration of charge. And that's why that charge collapse causes gravity, because as the charge accelerates, the experience of that acceleration of charge towards center is named the gravity. So once you know what causes a charge collapse, then for the first time, you know why objects fall to the ground. Unfortunately, Einstein, Stephen Hawking, NASA, no, they didn't figure it out. Second thing is that inertia of that charge moving towards center <clears throat> creates a self-sorting phenomena at the center of that tornado vortex where the pine cones kissing noses. Because as a charge moves toward that compression at center, the only wave that can move through that center and come out the other side has been sorted. As we say, just like after a good fight in an Irish pub. So when the compression is exchanged after the fight, I mean, after, after the compression, <laughs> the, the sorting phenomena means the only wave that gets through is, uh, is the one that agrees. <laughs> In other words, the shareable wave has been tested. <laughs> Pure intention has been tested. And that's called negentropy. 
it's the origin of all nature. And the proof of that actually is in phase conjugate optics, super dielectric and the lasers meet in opposite directions. And they call it time reversal and self-organization. And it's been measured, but it happens that all negentropy happens in that way as well between the pine cones kissing noses, because the implosion of charge towards center sucks all waves to that center and only the ones which are sorted can emerge. And that's the origin of negentropy. And in physics, that was measured. They called it time reversal, but actually it was self-organization because they could not time reverse toward disorder by measurement. No, 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 no. You can't time reverse clean steel to rusted steel. You can time reverse rusted steel back to clean steel, but not the reverse. In other words, you can only move toward order <laughs> when you're doing time reversal by measurement. What does that tell you? <laughs> that tells you that mega entropy and time reversal are basically the same thing. Anywho, so this, this charge collapse, solving the problem of charge collapse solves the problem of consciousness also, because you know why all these neuroscientists have always said, well, perception, focus, attention, collapse the wave function. What did they mean? It, you know, if you, if you got some waves and they're moving around and you want to take a picture, you have to collapse the wave function and imagine there was a still point because, you know, the taking the photograph, literally a digital sample, <laughs> is a process of creating a still point. And if there was no still point, there was no picture, there was no perception. So the still point, they say, the perception collapses the wave function. Well, it actually means more than that, as when Bill Tiller showed that by hundreds of measurements, focused human attention causes charge to compress. And if you got a really strong Draco doing a mind meld with you, it will feel like a vice. So the amount of compression in the electric field you call your attention is a, an electric measurement of how powerful your attention is. That's why charge collapse is so important. And just one final comment. When after uh, Ray Moody measured with many surgeons that deaf visions are contagious, the reason successful death is defined by charge collapse is important here because what's happening is that remember these kids who saw without their eyes with their eyes closed they went into a trance almost all of them after they get the vortex working they can see without, a lot of them they begin to see their ancestors which tends to freak out the western parents but the eastern parents have no problem with that, but that so the physics of the clairvoyance is that coherent longitudinal interferometry seeing their ancestors in that array, sometimes called ancestral memory, collective unconscious communion of saints, you get the flavor. So to get into that array of compressed and organized longitudinal EMF, sometimes called scalar, that array, the collective unconscious dreaming track song line, you don't get into that array unless you can do squeezing very good. And that's why death requires charge collapse. It is literally a, a mini black hole experience. You see the famous Heinrich Cluve form constants, lattice, cobweb, tunnel, spiral. And that's your DNA braid imploding to get you squeezing well enough to inhabit the array. And that's why if the death was not organized, the ghost gets stuck because you need to, to, to implode and squeeze very well in order that you can get to the charge, it's literally voltage density of the nodes in that array, the only place where telepathy is measurable, for example, and that's the dream track song line. And so to get into that array requires the squeezing of a successful death. And why, for example, Therify.net and other devices like that are famous for releasing stuck ghosts, because stuck ghost is a plasma field that failed to complete the implosion that enabled charge distribution. So charge collapse is a very good introduction to compression is the solution to almost every single problem physics has ever named. So successful compression or charge collapse is the definition and success of history of urban design. 
the definition of the success of alchemy, the definition of successful death, the definition of biologic architecture, the definition of fusion research, <laughs> the su successful death, successful compression, successful, successful, successful compression is the answer to every single problem you could actually think about if you're thinking only about pure principle. So I do recommend studying charge collapse, which is plantfire.com. Thank you for asking my favorite question there, Scott. <laughs> Pleasure. Bradley. Um, so like, uh, how can we measure objectively the, the, that hurts? And, 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 and when we say uh, like the, there's a concern of, of a tempo overstimulating, but is it more like we're just not used to using more of our brains when, so it seems subjectively like we're so, overstimulating, but we're just really using more of a brain. <laughs> so Nice. And, and that shows that you've really been thinking about these things. I appreciate that. And, but to answer specifically the first part of your question, so the, the tool that we're using to measure life force, flameandmind.com, remember, it is made of a brainwave spectrum analyzer. That's how we started. And that's how we measure life force in buildings very successfully. In fact, you know that Juan Schlosser in Bali, uh, bioarchitects.net, uh, and they have a multi-million dollar contract in India to build sacred temple based exactly on these principles. And he's the one who pioneered the use of ourflameinmind.com to measure life force in buildings. He had bamboo structures. He measured what's called harmonic inclusiveness, the spectrum analysis of the Schumann cascade in the bamboo buildings. And then we measured the correlation of that harmonic inclusiveness. Remember, harmonic inclusiveness defines how long anything is going to live. You, an electron, a tree, or a galaxy. It's lifetime is defined by harmonic inclusiveness. Any doctor knows that harmonic inclusiveness in heart rate variability is the best measure of your immune health. So harmonic inclusiveness perfected is the definition of golden ratio times Planck. So, which is to say non-destructive compression. So um, it, the <clears throat> ability to design a living space the reason, for example, therify.net is so famous for triggering seed germination, as were pyramids, is because centripetal force is basically the beginning of a seed's ability to germinate because it has to really suck. <laughs> and that really sucks. No, I mean, it, the ability to implode is how it's going to suck in its first nutrient. So it's obvious why pyramids originally were used to germinate seeds, because it made them implosive. So this is a big clue to what your building needs to do. Yeah. It needs to get, get centripetal. And we we measure very accurately the specific harmonics of that using the flame in mind brainwave software. There's lots of ways to do it, but that's very powerful. It can be reasonably inexpensive. You need to spectrum analyze a microvolt relatively accurately to do that. And a brainwave spectrum analyzer works great. Uh, and then you can see which building is alive and which is dead, and even which egg is alive and which is dead using the same transducer, actually. And those harmonic measures, those frequencies, that's not subjective. It's very accurate power spectra. And yes, then, you know, then your the layering of that building could be by design a more implosive capacitor. And actually, even the echo of the wind in those cavities. Measuring the possibility of an echo is actually much related because the phonon resonance is going to be in phase with the capacitance if you did it right. right. <laughs> Which is why the Sufi is looking for the perfect echo because they're right on their way to measuring the capacitor implode. <laughs> and and if, you're, if you want the place of power in a room, you literally can go in and kind of echo locate. <laughs> and... yeah. hey, thank you. We've also been talking about dousing a fair amount. Um... You know, it seems like you could build the perfectly designed structure and put it in the wrong place and not get the right results. So I think we should uh, address that just a little bit in terms of um, you talk a lot about the uh, the nodes of compression. So um, within the three dimensional space where we exist, there are nodes where there is a central crossing of energy. And then uh, we also have, uh, you know, the ley lines, the magnetic ley lines on the earth. And so, you know, if we take all those and, and we realize um, there are 
dozens, literally dozens of invisible uh, forces in the earth also to consider when we consider where to put our building, right? Um, radioactivity, infrared, um, gases coming out of the earth, uh, gravity anomalies, and so on. So, you know, what can you offer us in terms of um, how to practically douse and and how to integrate that into the overall process of the design? Again, that's a perfect question. Um, first of all, remember, since the magnetic lines of the Earth is the magnetic blood of the Earth and where magnetic lines cross is where ancestor memory and telepathy works and all temples and sacred space and labyrinths start where magnetic line crosses. Uh, so clearly that is life or death to be able to feel that magnetic line. And yes, okay, it's okay to go out and hire a dowser to help you locate where to put your house. However, I would caution you that if in general you cannot feel a magnetic line, unfortunately, that means you cannot feel. Oops. <laughs> Another way of saying that is, is the more you have access to bliss, peak experience, peak present, whatever, ecstasy, trance, there's a lot of names, but the, the implosion that precedes charge radiance named bliss, the more you have access to that uh, charge density, the more your blood becomes an antenna for the magnetic lines of the earth. So at first I noticed I could kind of feel them. And then when I, I don't need rods, I just hold my hands out. But then I noticed later that I can walk up to a field of, you know, some acres, a large field. And I use my inner radar and I can point to where the magnetic line crosses that field and walk to it. And almost every time the magnetic lines talk to me, it's, it's amazing. But this is after some years. But you, the magnetic lines of the earth literally are the blood of the earth and they are your blood. And to embed in that connection is life or death. So what I'm saying is, please just play around, start to learn that you can actually feel them for yourself. If you want to play with dousing rods, fine. The best thing to do is find your favorite spot in beautiful nature where you already suspect there's some energy there, you know? And then you really kind of relax and you walk slowly across what you suspect is the magnetic line and wait for your hands to tingle a little bit. <laughs> it, it's anybody can do it it's so simple and if you start training yourself suddenly you will be in a conversation with the magnetic blood of earth and that's fun man it's just like remember the dousing 101 when when they missed the water vein when they drilled the well the dowser shows up and uses a hammer and some rods and percussion and moves the water vein okay but you know what the advanced dowser does He'll never use a hammer and rods. Hell no. He goes down there and he talks to that water vein and they have a conversation. Oh, yeah, it's real. This is not subjective. You know, uh, ball lightning is highly famous for responding to telepathy for the same reason, living plasma. So, yes, the, the conversation with the magnetic lines of Earth is essential to your structure. Absolutely. There are many wonderful examples at bioarchitects.net where... Um, our partner, Oldrich Hosman, Olda in Prague, is expert in his examples of house layouts based on magnetic line dousing are fabulous. Uh, again, bioarchitects.net, Olda, and also the most advanced uh, geobiology school in Europe, uh, Stefan Cardino, uh, is also at goldenmean.info slash architecture. There are many, many examples of using a magnetic map to assist with the layout of the house, but essentially... The principle is that successful compression enables life force. It, it, it actually enables life itself. And so you do essentially need to train yourself to be able to make a simple magnetic map. As they said, our famous friend, Gary Skillen in Canada, his, he was famous. He, you don't tell him who is sick in your house. He goes in and makes a magnetic map of everybody's bed, and then he will tell you who's sick in the house. So your process here is you go make a magnetic map of your bed, your house, your yard, and your village, and then rearrange everyone to look like a rose, and you're done. <laughs> but, and, and that essentially means that, you know, when we went to Prague, yes, they attract money and tourists because the magnetic map 
of Prague is a rose, actually. And there are pictures there. And it's simple because it's originally a volcanic caldera, which made a magnetic map for the city that looked like a rose. Fascinating. Yeah. And by the way, I, I uh, my Claire audience, uh, Valerie wanted more conversations with her ancestors. And I'm I'm a klutzy Claire audience. I can hear ancestors sometimes. But when we were in Prague, <laughs> I was talking to her ancestors. <laughs> That's fabulous. Yeah, actually, we have a, a couple of students here that were my students last year, and they have reported to lucid dream together very nice and so i told yeah. him about you immediately and uh yes exactly because we're, we're working on that rather diligently because we believe that the planet as a whole gets more immune system when we have lucid dream teams this is called luciddreamteam.com actually <laughs> and we have a lucid dream teaming telegram group and lucid dream team gatherings uh jenny markey is the name of, of our wonderful shaman lady from australia who's leading a lot of that work the point being that when a group learns to lucid dream together they can collectively make centripetal force which has the power to dot 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 steer tornadoes repair geopathics uh, create a uh, resistance to parasites for the earth as a whole. Uh, the ability to lucid dream as a team is essential. And in fact, carry Mother Nature's silver seed through the sun to a new heart in the sun. Well, that Mother Nature's silver seed is just like a beehive swarming. They will never swarm without the presence of royal blood, which is to say the presence of the navigator. The navigator is you, as you learn how to lucid dream because you have become centripetal and you can therefore steer a successively larger tornadoes. It's essential. Beauty. Well, I also have uh, a lot of questions about, you know, Agni Hotra and, and sort of the ability that we have through a ceremony like Agni Hotra or the creation of a a beautiful harmonic temple or home to actually affect the surrounding ecosystem or the surrounding town. Um, Cause I've heard a lot of stories from you and other people about, you know, this practice of Agni Hotra where, you know, you're burning the cow dung and the ghee at the precise moment of sunrise saying a prayer and it, has a measurable effect on, I think, plant growth and animal growth within a certain radius, like a couple of acres. Is that right? Yes. Um, it, Agni Hotra is a very useful example here because um, you can see this pictures at fractalfield.com slash fractal space time or fractalfield.com slash online book. Uh, pictures are there of Agni Hotra. But the principle is that when they light that living plasma, which is the natural biologic ghee burning gently. And so you have a plasma cloud. Now that plasma cloud is placed in a copper pyramid, implosive capacitor, and advanced Agni Hotra, there's a larger giant pyramid underground below that. So it's highly implosive plasma. And now I remember when we did this, and it's called the Oma Homa Center in Poland. And this was a a farm which was like a garden of eden paradise in an area which was desertified I mean, the area was not fertile but that farm the, the few acres around that farm was visibly an incredibly green paradise and they had been intensively doing agni hotra there for years and the other famous story is that at bhopal disaster and at nagasaki those who survived were often those who accurately practiced Agni Hotra. The physics here is instructive. That sunrise and sunset, and you can feel your hair stand up just at that instant. I mean, they timed this with a computer. They got it precise when they lit that plasma. And you could feel that plasma wind converge and my hair stood up. It was very cool. It was accurately the second 
of sunset there in Poland. It was amazing. So what the sunrise sunset do, as the natives would call the four directions, they create the right angles necessary for phase conjugation. So the an ancestors called this the sacred four directions. In the physics of phase conjugation, this is called four wave mixing. It means when the flux lines converge accurately in the tetracubic lattice structure, this is what enables the pine cones to accurately focus and kiss implode where they touch noses. And so indeed, there you create a bubble of fertility, a bubble of neg entropy. And if this is done regularly, it, it's incredibly powerful. It's it's just a, an example. Another example is that, you know, the our plasma therapy, therify.net, is negentropic implosive broad spectral phase conjugate noble gas living plasma. We regularly have many of our Therify centers, there's in 25 countries, many of them do healing at a distance regularly. And we teach that the healing at a distance is not a mystery. We teach the physics that it's more likely if the sender and receiver are on a magnetic line cross. It's more likely if it's done at sunrise or sunset, or even better, equinox solstice, where the four waves can mix accurately and that implosion phase conjugates. And what happens in the four wave mixing where the implosion phase conjugates and the pine cones kiss noses is the convergence touches to the center of the pressure array lattice at the Planck threshold where the longitudinal coherence is enabled, embedded, and coupled. And that touching into the longitudinal array, what you would call the source, is the wave mechanics of all action at a distance. So in physics, when they call action at a distance requires entanglement to an Einstein-Rosen bridge, what they should more accurately say is that entanglement perfected is the problem phase conjugation solves, namely perfected embedding, which also happens to be the definition of compassion. So that ability to enable that embedding entanglement, in physics, they know that that's what makes action at a distance. They don't know that it's phase conjugation, which they call entanglement, which embeds perfectly and conjugates and touches the hard points of the longitudinal array. And that is DNA radio. That's actually the physics of teleporting. For example, when John Charles Moyen made those same exact brain waves that children make who see without their eyes, except he did much higher amplitudes, and he teleported repeatedly with witnesses documented, and his teleportations were caused by, were correlate to, and we measured his brain waves, dramatic alpha to gamma cascades, golden ratio and octave ladder structure, and that implosion connected him to that longitudinal array, which is the physics of all portal, all action at a distance. Because the reason that enables action at a distance, which is not unrelated to Agnihotra, is because <clears throat> when the implosion happens at the center of the pine cone, Planck, where the longitudinal connection is enabled, at that still point, it isn't that the velocity propagation nodes are infinite. It is more accurate that the velocity propagation nodes are in phi nit, namely, as Professor Raymond Chow measured, the harmonics faster than light are golden ratio multiples times the speed of light. And the number of golden ratio multiples faster than the speed of light that are propagating depends on the compression density, which is why the stargate in trapezium at the center of Orion is the most powerful stargate in our galaxy. Now, this is advanced science, but you're getting the flavor that if you begin to understand how Agnihotra works, you can begin to think about some fun stuff. It's really amazing. And you know, we're we're just at the very beginning in applying all of this physics to you know to our lives and, and really to the architecture. I think it's it's totally in its infancy at this time in history, um, but we can we can learn a lot from some of these ancient buildings as well. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm curious about um, other ways we can measure because. It's it's wonderful to to douse and to you know use our our nervous system as a measurement, but it seems useful also you know the flame and mind software and the antenna, it gives us some numerical data that I think lends a lot of credibility. So I think it's it's useful, and it and it can give us some feedback also about um, how our designs are working, for example. So. I'm wondering about you know gas discharge visualization um, 
There's the BioWell, the Sputnik device. I haven't used it yet, but that does something similar. You can get some measurements with that. The gas discharge visualization. Uh, also, you can you can see the bioenergy field. It's it's visualized. They have cameras. You can see it in real time. You know, so with all these tools, and, and I'm sure there's many others, you, you can you can enlighten us. But I'm wondering how we can start to use those tools to eventually uh, work on modeling, uh, you know, certain building designs before they're built. Even maybe we can get data from buildings that are already built and then kind of you know, use that in reverse and say, well, this is what worked. Well, let's repeat these shapes and these practices and, and so on. Um, so if there can be eventually more of kind of a formulaic approach where we'd say, if we do X, Y, and Z, we will get a charge implosive high capacitance building. Mm -hmm. um, is, you think that's possible or are we, are we going too techy? Should we just, you know? Well, it, I think we improve our intuition by measurement, absolutely, and both are wonderful here. And you're right to mention BioWell. You know, uh, Professor Karatkov, who invented the GTV, the BioWell, uh, we were good friends for many years. And uh, indeed, we had a very detailed discussion on one occasion and agreed that our spectrum analysis of the capacitance of the weak electric field of sacred building is perfectly parallel to what he's measuring. What he's measuring is... Uh, a passive capacitor, and which is basically a uh, a metal tree shape, and he measures the ability to propagate charge easily. So, in other words, for example, if you take a titanium cylinder and place it on a fingertip curlian device, which is what GDV really is and you happen to be in a corner of a metal building where your aura is horrible, <laughs> you will notice that a spark trying to propagate from there has big trouble. There is no way out. You're stuck. Oops. <laughs> and so when you measure the GDV of a horrible metal building, the capacitance that propagates, it's literally, you know, when you take a Gas discharge visualization, the Curlian type photograph, is your finger is on the surface of a glass plate and there's a big spark underneath. That's all it is, really. And they just measure whether the spark has some place to go. That's it. And if your finger is happen it happens to be brilliantly healthy and ecstatic, the spark around your fingertip can propagate beautifully and make gorgeous pictures. And then they know that you're healthy. They measure the size of the propagation and the fractality thereof. So the same is true of a sacred building versus an ugly metal building. If the spark has no place to go, charge distribution is not enabled, hint, opposite of fractality, uh, so the point is the principle is exactly the same. In both cases, we're measuring charge distribution efficiently. Slightly, two slightly different ways. He developed some pretty cool mathematic algorithms for quantifying the fractality of the boundary conditions of the array of the Curlian photograph. I mean, this was pretty cool mathematics they did there in Russia with our professor Constantine, our buddy there. But, you know, it's true that our technique, which actually measures the specific harmonics thereof, enables more diagnostic kind of activity, but the principle is the same. So yes, all you're looking for is charge distribution efficiency, literally where auras can breathe. That is the principle. And you're right, multiple ways of measuring that are very useful. I might mention also at goldenmean.info slash geobiology, our work with Stefan Cardino, where we were measuring magnetic lines now, there was a handheld detector you'll see there at goldenmean.info slash geobiology. And you can measure a few nano Teslas. And if you're very still and very relaxed and there's no wind, you can almost measure an earth grid magnetic line in nano Teslas. But it's a very sensitive measure. Now, there's some very big array devices that can do that nicely. But the handheld ones are a little uh, too noise susceptible. But the point is, once you understand the measurement technology, you can measure earth grid magnetic lines in nano Teslas, as you can also measure the frequency signature of earth grid magnetic lines. And all of Stefan Cardino's work in that regard also are at goldenmean.info slash geobiology, the 30, 50, 60, 80 Hertz, which are the natural resonance frequencies of Hartman, Peiwei, Curry, Palm, the Wiseman, the different 
energy lines of the earth. We actually know the frequencies thereof. So this advanced science of geobiology is very deep. You can actually do the research and it's a very deep and wonderful science. Point being in terms of Scott's question, um, yes, at least to understand enough of the basics of this so you can begin to predict in advance which building is going to have a shot at that level of charge distribution efficiency. You know, the bigger picture of that building, the old feng shui principle of Ming Tang, you know, where the rivers cross and make a little womb shape energy bubble. There's a big picture here too. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, well, we're getting to a point where we could create, uh, you know, we could do the same design of a, a certain form, a certain geometry we know that is pretty effective. And we could put that same building in two different places on the earth, two different locations. And then and that way you're starting to isolate the variables, right? Then you can measure things or you could, um, you know, build a slightly different structure in the same location at different times and get different measurements. Uh, but what I found really fascinating is what you told me last year, you said that, uh, you know, we can't just build a scale model of a structure and get any kind of useful measurement of it because why it it's not it's not this final size and so it doesn't uh capture the uh it wouldn't be in ratio two <laughs> yeah it's not related to the the wavelengths of all the frequencies surrounding it in the same way as the final version so we really need to build the full size version and then measure it and it seems like there's there's really no other way. I mean, apart from maybe some a little down the road, we could have some, you know, AI computer modeling or something like that. But um, just building the full size model, I think, is is the way to go. There's some wonderful precedent to this kind of work, which uh, Juan Schlosser beautifully did there in Bali, uh, goldenmean.info slash architecture, and actually put together a book on that, where he showed that the bamboo structure versus the metal structures uh, you know, measure the harmonics, measure the seed germination, correlated and showed replicably that uh, it, it was true that the biologic material caused the harmonic signature that replicably caused seed germination, measure the seed germination, measure the harmonic and proved that distant difference between a biologic and a non-biologic building. So you know, some of that work has been done. It's beautiful. So I, I live uh, here in Arizona and um, just thinking about how humans follow their beliefs rather than what is. So uh, the last governor was following this ideology, ideology which caused uh, them to form this huge border with uh, stacked uh, 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 freight, freight containers. And then that also destroys the biodiversity that's like millions of years evolved. And, um, and those are like fractal complexes too, you know, the cactus itself and so um so i'm think so i'm thinking about like ways to like transmute that energy like people have thought about like doing aeroponic gardens in those uh freight uh shipping containers and then like encasing it in a structure that would um start to uh transmute some of that energy because you're you know dealing with metal you know so i was just wondering your thoughts on that like how we can take things like that and transmute and mitigate and transform, you know. Yeah, that, that, that is a bit of a hard one. I, you know, there are lots of people now that are doing pictures of we made our house from a few shipping containers. Well, actually, <laughs> from the point of view of, of my study of this, the steel that is a shipping container is by definition fatal to every kind of living capacitance. Sorry. <laughs> I don't, people say, well, yeah, you could hang some hemp fiber and put some clay here and there. <laughs> Maybe you could create a little island of capacitance somewhere. But in general, a steel shipping container is pretty much as much of a nightmare as you can get in terms of living architecture. So I, I can't think of a way offhand that a stack of steel shipping containers could transmute anything <laughs> beyond me. Yeah. Yeah, I heard some. Um, some clients of mine I was talking to last night, actually, and they're doing an amazing project to uh, do some refugee housing in Maui right now that I'm, I'm assisting with. And they really want to use these steel studs that they have because, you know, they're recycled steel. So it 
on, on the one hand, it's an available material and it is quite durable and it's very lightweight. Um, but I told them, hey, it's, it's not really fitting with my principles of what I know to be the best practices. And they asked, well, isn't there a way we can get around this and maybe do something to the steel studs to improve them? Like maybe coat them with uh, a copper paint or something like that. And I said, well, maybe. So that's my question. It's, yeah, it, it, it's true that a small amount of metal may be necessary in some places. And if it's uh, well surrounded by a good biological material, one of the highest dielectrics happens to be hemp, actually. Hemp fibers have a fabulous dielectric. So maybe that could help a bit. I'm not sure. And I, I'm sure there are situations where you have to have a small amount of metal, and I can understand that. But in general, if you look at every sacred temple that ever existed, you know, there's a place called the Integratron in Arizona, since we're talking about it, that I knew the guy that was involved in that. And they went to a huge, huge amount of trouble to build that Integratron without a single piece of metal. <laughs> and that was before my day. They figured something out. If you want the capacitor to implode. <laughs> so actually, unfortunately, yes, I, but I do think you can build a bit of a sacred altar in your home even if there's some metal in the walls by you know creating some biologic material and create a bit of a bubble i do think that is possible of course can we talk a little bit about what juan schlosser is doing with uh mineralizing the wood the bamboo materials because i know he's, he's he's working with the technique where i think they're removing the sugars from the wood fiber cellulose uh, soaking it in a solution and then uh, and then soaking the wood in another solution that adds a lot of minerals to the the, the cellulose and so it's preserving it it's it's basically like a you know like a mineralization you know and and so this process could offer a lot of capacitance to a building because of the the minerals embedded in the wood. And do you know anything about that process? Or? Um, well, I heard a little, and it, it reminds me of a wonderful short story. So the day I first learned to make a living capacitor, uh, Professor Phil, Ga Phil Callahan in Florida, tuning into nature, uh, shows us how to measure whether a tree is going to live or die. And so he takes these this little hemp fibers you know hemp cloth a small amount and he wraps it around a, an oscilloscope probe and he's you know spectrum analyzing a microphone and then he says but there's one more thing you got to do he says you dip this into some living seawater and let it dry in the sun hint trace mineral hint uh, rhodium iridium hint organic hormies and and then he said something which is even more interesting he said and if you don't have any living seawater handy, you can soak it with some living human sweat. That works great also. <laughs> no sweat, man. And, and uh, you, you have these images of the Aboriginal tribe initiating the new young teenage boys. And how do they do it? They wipe him down in the sweat of all the males. <laughs> Doesn't that sound romantic? But uh -huh. actually, you see, there's a trace mineral. And then when that bakes in the sun, that is a fabulous biological capacitor. I mean, that's how the first living capacitive probes were made, was baking in the sun a little bit of the trace mineral of deep sea water or living human sweat, actually. So yes, that trace mineral correctly baked in can produce a radically gorgeous biologic capacitor, I'm sure, if you measure the dielectric constant. So that there would be a lot of good reason for getting the right trace minerals buried. And the trace mineral recipe would be related to which uh, deep sea water they make this... Uh, uh, sacred water with, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, the deep sea water they take to make agricultural ormies from, because it's high in rhodium iridium emulate, so the right trace mineral. And you bake that into the bamboo and the wood. Oh yeah, excellent capacitor. Okay. So is there a way to measure the capacitance of different materials without measuring the space? Like I use my flame in mind, but I want to know, is there is there another device? Can I, uh, you know, touch it to the material and 
and it'll tell me how, you know, how conductive it is, or is there a way to measure that? Well, uh, you know, electrical engineering 101 here, uh, a digital capacitance meter is not expensive these days and, uh, and is measured in micro or nanofarad typically. Now, to measure the dielectric constant, all you do is you take a known area of metal plates and you know the thickness and you stick whatever material between the plates of the capacitor and measure the amount of capacitance you just made. And there's a formula and out comes the dielectric constant, which is simply saying how efficient that capacitor was. So that is the theory. Uh, so the measurement of capacitance is, is measurable. And indirectly, the amplitude of the peaks at flame in mind is telling you how powerfully that capacitor is resonating. So when the amplitude of the peaks in your brain waves are really strong and the amplitude in the peaks of the, your measurement of a tree are really high, that means that's efficient capacitance. Well, it's not a, it's kind of question, um, Mr. Winter. First, you remind me, Carlos Castaneda, I read hey. that book <laughs> like 30, three decades ago. <laughs> and Second, I was in a place on Mexico, in Jalisco. I don't remember how they call, but it's an energy place. Like you can, you can hear your own voice if you stand up in this in the center. Uh -huh. Good and, echo. Yeah. Yes, it was so weird. And I was in a lot of caves as well, and they allow me one of the guards they allow me to enter a certain space that I was not public. And the echo was, and the energy was amazing. That's that I, right. So it was kind of weird and strange and yeah, so. <laughs> it's so cool that it's almost literally true. Immortality is the perfect echo. This definition of sacred space is the perfect echo. I mean, that is a physics metaphor you could take quite literally. <laughs> it is, it is. But those spaces when you are echo with your own voice so you cannot hear that energy places, I think it's a few on and, and earth, right? A few. It Unfortunately, because we've we've messed up so many of those. Yes. And and we don't teach what sacred space is, we don't teach what having a soul is, and we don't teach the what a perfect echo is electrically, which actually is this perfect resonance and perfect charge distribution. So it's urgent that we make this message shareable. Thank you. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways to look at biology in this regard. You know, our Flame and Mind software, the Flame and Sound, has specific harmonics to trigger specific glands. There's quite a bit of literature on that, and even to trigger a specific chakra. So the liver would certainly fit into that matrix. And the other things to bear in mind there would be um, not just the frequency signature, but things like uh, the alkalinity of the water. Uh, we're drinking this Kangen alkaline water, and it's so dramatic for helping flush the liver, for example. And uh, things like uh, livingplasmatherify.net uh, help the blood uh, remove the toxins and they're depo deposited in the liver, and that's good. But if you just had chemo and the, <laughs> the plasma triggers the toxins into your liver too quickly, that's dangerous. So understanding and recognizing how detox works in the liver is very critical, obviously, and uh, that uh, experience of detox is directly related to where did the charge implode, because where the charge implodes is where the sorting has happened. So if your body has the opportunity to be in places of high charge, for example, take a swim in ice cold, fresh river water or something like that, you know, your body gets a lot of implosive capacitance. Whereas if you're never grounded, you never did the book Earthing, then your liver is having a tougher time. Oh, thank you so much. And by the way, I love your website, the therify.net, how you scroll down and there's that hedron. And I looked up who your designers were for your web design. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's an imploding double helix. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, it's neat. <laughs> thank you.
I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of the, you know, the Therify device because I, I didn't really explain before this, but uh, so Dan and uh, Paul Harris is his name, right? Came mm -hmm. up with this device that produces a uh, golden ratio cascade of frequencies. It sort of is mimicking, you know, what you see in the earth and at the Great Pyramids, and it, it is a healing series of frequencies. And I've used the device more than a few times, and I absolutely love it. It it induces bliss, and it's known to create spontaneous healing and and lucid dreaming and Kundalini uh, sometimes. <laughs> yes, Kundalini. It's it's sort of a, a sacred space in a box, you know. <laughs> like you can bring this thing and plug it in, and it creates. And we're not space. we're not saying you need a gadget, but if you if you want to play with a gadget, here's an example. But the one thing to be noted, if you see the picture at therify.net and the how it works page. You know those things they call the light bulbs in in the Egypt stone carvings. They look like plasma tubes. That's actually what the Therify looks like. And he, so when the when the Egyptians when the Anunnaki said we're making a Shem unto the Lord, and that was mistranslated that an altar in the church, uh, Sitchin translated that Shem to mean high word firestone implosive capacitor and the function was well articulated in the Anunnaki literature. It was because they were aging catastrophically. So when they built a Shem unto the Lord, if you transliterate the Sumerian, they were literally building their critically necessary age reversal electric field. So to build a Shem unto the Lord in Sumerian is quite literally, from an electrical engineering, we needed an age reversing electric field because when they got here, they were aging catastrophically and they said so. So if you would like to build a Shem unto the Lord, as you have been instructed in the Sumerian, I suggest you consider building an age-reversing electric field, which is the word Shem means, remember, means access to a black hole, as in alchemy and schematic, and the original name for Egypt, the place of the blue-black blood. So access to a black hole is a definition of alchemy and chemistry because it's access to charge collapse. So you see that when the Egyptians made a picture, they call the Egyptian light bulb, which turns out to be a pretty accurate photograph of Therify.net, they needed age reversal and they said so. So suddenly the concept of time reversing and phase conjugation has a very ancient meaning. Thank you, Scott, for asking another one yes, of the most yes. fun questions here. Well, I mean, I love this conversation because we can... We can touch on all these different topics and they're all really so intimately tied together yeah. and i really enjoy you know looking forward into the near future i mean very near future we have so many changes positive changes coming and part of it's due to you know our understanding of of physics and reality and the, and the technologies and better design and so i'm i'm wondering what you see dan in terms of you know, the next steps in, in housing and uh, biological architecture design and, you know, how how we can and really push it forward and implement it. And and really, what are some of the new technologies that will be involved in, in the houses coming really soon? I mean, we could have a Therify in every house and we could have, uh, you know, we can have the ability to, um, you know, promote charge collapse, maybe even create free energy, maybe have gravity reversal and, and things like that. So what is, what's your vision of, of the near future for housing? You know, I, I've done many international lectures on uh, the generalized principle of the origin of all vacuum energy devices. You can see those lectures, fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy, including the International Amsterdam Conference there. Um, and the principle behind all zero point vacuum energy devices is specifically enabled charge collapse, for sure. There is no question. And that is exactly what we're discussing. When you get the momentum gathered in that implosive collapse towards center, that is the physics of the reason every single zero point energy device worked from the moment Schauberger's piezoelectrically rock powder dope water vortex spontaneously got colder and began making electricity from gravity to why the plasma tubes of Therify sometimes spontaneously get colder. That is charge collapse and that is zero point energy. And that is the right question. 
we don't have time, obviously, for the electrical engineering now, but I'd like to make one more comment about Scott's question about the future. And he, this is just a humble suggestion. Remember when Castaneda said, you need to know where your place of power is. I'm going to suggest to you that your children, our children, need to know where their place of power is, actually. The place they could regularly go to be recharged, literally. Is it a stone circle out in the yard? Is it their favorite circle of trees? Is it their favorite magnetic line through the house? Is it their little altar with the crystals? Whatever it is, every child needs to know where they can be recharged, as do you. And that is that is an immediate question. So I threw the challenge back in our laps now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It reminds me of the little grove of the forest that I used to visit as a kid. You know, yep. at four years old, I'd walk down the road and just go hang out in the forest. And yeah. uh, and you can feel your your hands buzzing. I would feel my exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a place through this house where the magnetic line from sacred Canigou Mountain goes through. And I know where, you know, you know where you can go to be recharged if you need any time, and that the children need to be taught, which is similar to saying, as that they cheered in the church in Italy when I said, the definition of culture is not the color of your shoe polish and wine. No, the definition of culture is, do you have the skill to teach your young people how to have a bliss experience? That defines culture because that defines their immune system and their immortality. On that note, <laughs> thank you dan thank you so awesome. much for being here you had some really fun appreciate it. thank you nice to meet you all it's Listen. a pleasure and an honor yes have a Blessings. good night dan let's stay in touch talk soon blessings bye-bye